Okay, we're night. Okay. All right. Uh, Jonathan. Okay. Hello, guys. And uh, yes, we're live on Facebook at this point. And before we start, just a few reminders. So again, we'd like to uh, remind everybody uh, to uh, well, be aware of your surroundings and how you appear visually. So a quiet location with no background noise and closed blinds on windows so that you are easier to see in the video. And also please be aware of your behavior. Well, since everyone can see you um, and you are on a video conference, others can see what you're doing at all times. So please um, be mindful of that and follow all instructions in the video conferencing invitation and note important supplemental information such as a backup phone number in case you are disconnected. Okay, and uh, for those who have just joined us, again, as mentioned by our presenter, if you want to have access to the slide, um, just scan the QR code that is currently uh, that is currently flashing or uh, appearing on the screen. So please um, do that if you want to have an up close uh, access to the uh, presentation. And uh, okay, so is everyone here? Press smart. I think we can start now. All right. So I just accept <laughs> accept them. <laughs> okay. So as they, okay, all right. And all right, so again, hello. And uh, again, this is Jonathan Yu. Uh, and it's been a week, you know, since our last session. And welcome again to another informative and dynamic webinar series this afternoon, of course, brought to us by the United Architects of the Philippines, Singapore chapter, headed by their ever reliable chapter president, architect Mark Lester Valignata. Uh, District B1 Council, and of course, in coordination with the UAP Regional District Director, the dependable and indispensable architect, Luis Domalaon. And at this point, we'd like to also uh, give thanks and uh, make special mention to our generous sponsors for supporting this webinar series since day one. Okay. Well, please make sure that you are on mute, guys, because uh, we are about to start the um, session. But again, going back uh, to our sponsors, thank you so very much for supporting this webinar series, this month-long uh, sem seminar online via Zoom. And uh, since day one, you've been showing us your, uh, your unwavering support. So special thanks to Connects, Angeline, Unitech, Davis Paints, Tongson Law Offices, VK5 Solutions, PTE, uh, Private Limited Singapore, and Adapt Star Lab. So maraming maraming salama. Thank you very much for uh, supporting us. And for also, I'd like to at this point, ladies and gentlemen, to welcome us all before we get the ball uh, rolling. I'd like to call on our Manila Atelier Chapter President, Architect James Howe. FUAP for the opening remarks. Architect James, how are you there? Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Jonathan. Can you hear me now? Yeah, I can. We can hear okay. you. Okay. Thank you, Chapter President, Singapore, Mark Lester. Okay, today we have two distinguished speakers. Welcome again, uh, District Director Luisito Dumalaon. I just saw you. Okay, today we have two distinguished speakers. The first topic, data science for building industry, research and skills that will change the industry. As we know, data analysis play a crucial role to reach better decisions in every project. The building industry is exploding with data sources that impact the performance of the built environment and the health and well-being of occupants. So this is very interesting topic for this afternoon. The second topic towards zero carbon buildings, green action plan, our speaker is architect Edgardo Magliari from Green AP. As we know, the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change warned of catastrophic climate breakdown if global average temperature rose by two degrees centigrade. 
this will result to negative consequences for our communities and the planet Earth. What does it mean for us? Is there a chance to transform our sector from a major cause of climate emergency? Or is there a major solution to it? Net zero is our goal. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the District B1 webinar this afternoon. Thank you very much. All right. Well, thank you very much, Architect Howe, for that very warm welcome. And uh, well, as mentioned by Architect Howe, ladies and gentlemen, today we are very lucky you know, to have the best of both worlds, a celebrated speaker from the West who will share his vast experience in data science in relation to your occupation as an architect, and a Southeast Asian speaker, well, I'd say our very own pride in the Philippines, who will talk about journey to net zero carbon through renewable energy sources. And I hope you guys are all excited as I am as we discover new learnings today, because here at UAP, learning never ends. So let's get the ball rolling. At this juncture, I am privileged to have the opportunity to introduce our first speaker. He is an assistant professor at the National University of Singapore in the Building and Urban Data Science Lab. He is also the co-leader of Theme D Data Analyt Analytics at the UC Berkeley Syn also known as Sinber Best 2 Lab, and the co-leader of Subtask 4 of the International Energy Agency Annexed 79 Occupant-Centric Building Design and Operation. He holds a Doctor of Science from the ETH Zurich, or Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Zurich, Master of Science from the National University of Singapore, and Bachelor of Science, Masters of Architectural Engineering from the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. He is the former Chief Technology Officer of Optiras Private Limited, a Singapore National Research Foundation-funded startup, a former Fulbright Scholar to Singapore at the National University of Singapore, and also a Walter Scott Jr. Scholar at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm glad to introduce him to all of you, a man who always seeks knowledge and wisdom. Please welcome Dr. Clayton Miller. Thank you very much, Mark. I appreciate the, the warm welcome and the warm introduction. Uh, I have a like 45 minute presentation to date. I wanna give kind of a, an overview of uh, a couple different areas of research that my team does at the National University of Singapore. And then the third part is really all about skills and, and really kind of um, uh, pushing people within the building industry, including architects, to learn how to code and to learn uh, data science and machine learning techniques, because it is very possible to do. Uh, if you want to download these slides uh, as I go through them, if you want to click, be able to click on links and things like that, you can scan this QR code with your phone or you can follow the, the link at the bottom, uh, the bit.ly link at the bottom. Um, I'll also have this QR code at the very end so that you can, uh, you, can you have another chance to, to, to click on it or to go to, the, to download the slides as well at the, at the end while we do uh, Q&A. Uh, so, uh, yeah, just a little introduction to the group that, that I lead at NUS. We are uh, called the BUDS Lab. Um, we're focused on building an urban data science. You can see kind of the, the crew there on the right-hand side below me. We've got uh, people from pretty much every continent in the world in our group, except, of course, Antarctica. We've got people from South America, Africa, Asia, North America, and uh, Aust Australasia. And we focus in um, data science, so leveraging data sets from the built environment for, uh, to, re to reduce energy consumption, to improve performance, and to improve satisfaction of humans in the built environment. Uh, so you can, you can click on this QR, or sorry, scan this QR code also, or go to our website if you want to find out more about some of the other research projects that, that we do. Uh, about half of our team are, are architects and slash engineers, and the other half are computer scientists, in fact. So we're, we're kind of an example of a interdisciplinary lab, um, which is becoming more and more common in universities, including in uh, departments of architecture. So we are in what's called the Department of Building. We're not in the Department of Architecture, we're Department of Building at NUS. And this is kind of the sister department to architecture where we dive into more, um, slightly more technical issues and sort of the 
um, in some of the engineering side of architecture. However, quite a few of our students are have architecture backgrounds. Um, and we, we work closely with the architecture side as well in the design uh, buildings. Uh, in addition, our group is also um, affiliated with the NUS Institute of Data Science. And so this whole um, field of data science is really, uh, it's, it's really important that the application, the context or the domain is involved when you do data science. So it can't just be uh, take a bunch of code and throw it at data. There has to be a reason behind that. There has to be motivation uh, and the context is really important, which is why um, we, we have an interdisciplinary lab with both architects and data scientists. So to get started, I want to kind of shout, like cast a, a, a bit of knowledge about the building industry um, that you might not be aware of. It's, this is a little bit of an outdated study, um, but it's still relevant, I believe, is that uh, in, in the building industry, we, we're, we don't have the same efficiency uh, uh, labor versus productivity or output efficiency is what you see in other industries. So this is an article from The Economist in 2017. Um, and it really, the, the graph on the left is, is quite telling in, in that uh, the hours per worked uh, in terms of the value added is uh, we're, we're lagging quite far behind agriculture, manufacturing, retail, and other industries. Technology has really improved efficiency in those areas for, for obvious reasons. But for us in the construction industry, it, it hasn't. It hasn't made it as much of an impact. And there's various reasons why, and, and I'll, I'll try to cover those as much as I can. But one of my beliefs is that it, the, the scalability within the building industry or developing techniques which can basically uh, scale across buildings is, is really difficult. Um, every building is, is almost like a prototype in a sense. And we do that uh, because buildings are, are a part of culture. They're not just a, an iPhone or a, a, a laptop that you can sort of mass produce a million of the devices and, and be done with it. Every building has a sense of purpose and its own aesthetics, its own character. And so scalability is really difficult. So we don't, we don't get the economies of scale. So it, there, we have special uh, challenges in the building industry that, that we need to try to address using data science, but doing it in a different way as other industries. And so I'll try to talk about that in this presentation. Um, so machine learning. So machine learning and AI and, and big data and all of these buzzwords you, you hear all about in the news, they have transformed all these other industries. Advertising, of course, you know, you have uh, the big search engines, marketing you, and retail, you've got all of the big uh, online stores um, and in lots of other sectors. So, so why not buildings? What, why, what, what can we do to get these type of um, techniques to influence the way we do things in the built environment. So before we get dive into, uh, into the, the, the weeds, let's talk a little bit about what machine learning actually is. So machine learning, there, there's a couple different flavors of machine learning. The first one is what's called unsupervised learning. Unsupervised learning is where you're taking uh, data or objects. In this case, it's kind of represented as these small uh, shapes that are different shapes and colors. And you're using an algorithm to be able to organize those objects into groups of similar objects. So you're taking tons of raw data and you're using algorithms to sort of put similar data in similar uh, pots, let's say, so that a human can look at each of those um, and say, those are yellow squares and red circles and, and uh, green diamonds, et cetera. Uh, the other one, the other type of learn, machine learning, which is a little bit more common when you when you look at uh, the application in the industry, so it's called, is what's called supervised learning, which is where you're taking objects, and you're, a human is is applying labels to those objects, and once you have what's called labeled samples or tr what's called training data, you're using that data to then train a model, and when a new sample comes in that's unknown the prediction, that model is actually able to predict the class uh, or be able to predict the value of that thing. So, so to de I mean, it's just to try to demystify what is machine learning, this is kind of a, a, a simple overview of that. So like I said, it's revolutionized a lot of uh, different industries by providing predictive power that's beyond what human beings can, can provide. So one example uh, that I'll dive into a little bit is in, 
in the, in the building industry is something called measurement and verification. So this is an application that's, that's pretty well known if you're kind of within this sort of field. MNV is really useful when you implement some sort of intervention. So let's say a retrofit of a building or some sort of redesign of a building. You would then, as soon as that intervention is applied or renovation is applied, you create what's called an adjusted baseline model, which is the blue line, to predict what, how much energy your building would have used if that installation had not been implemented. And the green line in this graphic shows what actually happens. So if you install some sort of energy saving implementation, that's your, your building uses less energy. And so the delta between these two lines is the energy savings calculation, which is normalized for the different factors uh, like weather and, and, and different things like that. Um, and it's really one of the kind of the low hanging fruit in terms of analyzing uh, and using machine learning. So in my research team, we, we, we dove into this particular context, which is a little bit removed maybe from a typical architecture flow, but, but I think some of you might be familiar with this, this type of application. And what we found was that when, when we look at prediction models in this area, all of the literature, all the research, a lot of the stuff out there, the techniques that are out there is only applying, they're only creating techniques on a building by building basis. So you're basically building models for individual buildings. So, so this is a review of a bunch of those type of studies. And most of those studies were creating techniques when only looking at a single building, which is okay if you, know, if, if you only have one building to analyze, but it's becoming more common that we're looking at not just one building, we're looking at portfolios of buildings or whole districts or sometimes even whole cities of buildings. And it, it, it becomes difficult to be able to scale our machine learning across large numbers. So a way to illustrate this, this is kind of the status quo in the building industry when we, when we talk about machine learning uh, innovation in, in our industry. We're really stuck on case studies, which, which, which is a product of us being focused on a project by project basis. So in the, in the machine learning community uh, for buildings, we see the same type of behavior. Uh, a researcher will look at a case study, they'll collect data, they'll create an algorithm and they'll say, my algorithm is the best. It's faster, it's accurate, it's more easy, to, it's easier to implement. And then case study B and, and, and researcher B does the same thing and C does the same thing. So the problem that we have is that how can algorithm A really be compared to algorithm B or C? How can we really know which is the fastest or best method to, to, to analyze the, the data from, from buildings? Well, we, we can't, we can't compare these. So one of the big things that we work on in, in research is creating, trying to create what's called benchmark data sets or large open data sets of building data. And so if you have this large data set, everyone can apply their algorithms to the data set and they can truly be able to compare their techniques against each other and really be able to say that uh, they have the fastest or most accurate or easiest to implement types of techniques. So um, there's a couple different areas that, that, that sort of the missions that my team is really focused on. Um, and I'll talk about both of these in a, in a few different contexts um, is, to, is to improve the scalability of machine learning using larger open data sets, using larger applications, um, trying to make it what's called generalizable. Or basically, um, if you create a technique, you can apply it to lots of different buildings, even though those buildings are different. And the other key point is that, which I think is super important, is teaching industry professionals like architects to use these models by teaching them how to code context specific data science skills. So let, we'll, we'll dissect each of these over the next uh, 20 minutes or so. So one of the things that we've done is we've, we've really started collecting lots of data sets over the last five years. This is a, a publication um, and data set that we, re we released in 2017. Uh, myself and Dr. Forrest Meggers from Princeton University. Uh, it's a, a data set of over 500 buildings where we have as much information as we could get from those buildings with respect to performance. So we have lots of um, electricity in this data set, electrical meter data at a frequency of one hour intervals um, for one full year. So this was, at the time, this was the largest data set to, to be collected. And a lot of people have been doing research on this data to be able to create techniques that can scale across 500 buildings and not just a single building at a time. Um, to build on top of that, we, I was a part of a team, a large international team to create 
uh, a machine learning competition to grow the, uh, the, the interest in machine learning in the building industry even, even more uh, on a platform called Kaggle. So if any of you uh, are interested in machine learning or data science um, and have not heard of Kaggle, please check it out. Kaggle is a, uh, a website which has tons of resources to learn how to code and to learn about data science. One of their key features is a, con is a, is a competition platform. So we, we created a competition where people would download what's called a training data set. They would create machine learning models and they would upload their predictions onto the site. And instantly their predictions would be scored against their the other people on the platform. And at the end of the competition, which was a 90 day competition, the top five winners were splitting 25,000 US dollars of prize money that was hosted by, or sorry, that was sponsored by the ASHRAE organization, which is the kind of the large uh, HVAC and energy related organization in the United States and worldwide. ASHRAE has, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with, um, there's a large ASHRAE chapter in uh, Singapore and the Philippines and other parts of um, Southeast Asia. So the competition process itself, like I mentioned, the, the contestants were provided with these, the, the blue boxes, the blue areas, they were provided with 12 months of training data and also weather data, and they were asked to predict the orange and red areas. So those were actually the predictions that they submitted onto the platform. So if you're interested in machine learning, you can kind of dive into that and learn about like what is training and what is test data sets and what do these things mean. Um, but this was kind of the context if you're already familiar with those terms. And like I said before, this was, uh, uh, you know, people downloading the data set, making a prediction and getting a score on the leaderboard in real time. And the top scores at the end were splitting the prize money. So the really cool thing about this whole competition was the, the volume, the number of people that we got to, that were part of it. So it was over 4,000 total participants that were combined, uh, you could create a team. So there was about th over 3,600 uh, total teams from all over the world, from over almost 100 countries, 94 countries. And a lot of these people were um, from data science. The, uh, the Kaggle platform has uh, over a million users and a lot of them are data science experts. But we also found quite a few people from the engineering and even sometimes uh, the architecture domain participating and learning through this competition. So it was really exciting. It was all across the world. Um, and one of the best parts was not just the fact that we had the top five winning solutions uh, that, were, that were open sourced eventually, but also the fact that lots of people were uh, doing their machine learning workflows in the public part of Kaggle. So actually crowdsourcing or sort of showing their machine learning workflows. So there are over 450 different workflows and in, in the Kaggle platform, it's called a notebook. And the breakdown of the, the types of information from these notebooks you can see here. So there was, in fact, the largest uh, category of shared workflows which is what's called starter code. So there's really just a huge amount of example starter workflows that people can look at to learn uh, how the, the, the different competitors approach the problem, this competition, and the code that they use, the explanations they used, um, lots of really interesting things. So if you're interested in learning, um, like I said, definitely check out this Kaggle competition. You'll also notice on Kaggle that there are um, dozens or even, I mean, throughout the, the history of Kaggle, there are almost uh, probably hundreds of competitions in other domains besides the building industry. This is one of the first competitions that was from the building domain, especially energy, but there are lots of other competitions where you can learn um, data science skills from. So as I mentioned, uh, the top five winners you can see uh, here um, that had the best scores was it was a, a, a few different teams and a few different individuals. We have since uh, consolidated all of these solutions and we've open sourced the solutions. In fact, because it's a it was a hosted by ASHRAE as a nonprofit competition, uh, those solutions are are shared with the world. So if you really get far deep into the machine learning um, community from the building industry, you can, you can see these solutions and see how these uh, competitors um, basically pr provided the best solutions. We're planning uh, a few more Kaggle competitions, hopefully in the future. One of the next one being focused on um, 
building management system or energy management system data. So a little bit more on the engineering side, but um, still relevant. We're also hoping that eventually there's an architectural design related competition potentially where you could have parametric analysis of models or something like that. And, and there could be some sort of machine learning objective to that. So it's, uh, we're, we're hoping this can become a, um, a competition that's held every few years or maybe every year if, if ASHRAE or if the industry support is there. So we talked a lot of, I, the, that context is all about energy and performance, but, but let's look at another context for machine learning. Let's talk about occupants. Let's talk about uh, uh, wellness and, and satisfaction and comfort and, and these type of things. Um, an, analyzing energy is great, but what about these occupants? So we have another project that's in this direction. It's trying to focus on what, what I consider the old, the age old question in the built environment. What do occupants want? How do we satisfy them? And as architects and engineers in the design phase, you're, 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 you're really relying on the standards that, that, that are out there, especially like ASHRAE comfort standards or uh, the codes, you know, like the, the, the codes related to thermal comfort and, and, and air quality. So you're relying on those codes to guide your design. Um, but we find out through research that some of those, those um, guidelines are, are, are not working, basically. Um, so the, there's a model called the PMV PPD model, which is the foundation for ASHRAE standard 55, which is the thermal comfort standard that's used all around the world. And what, what the research found was they collected tons of data from lots of research studies from around the world. And they found that, that this model is only actually accurate about one third of the time. Meaning that when we predict a person will be comfortable or not comfortable on a seven point scale, um, and what they actually, occupants actually say whether they're comfortable or not, is, is, is there's a mismatch, a strong mismatch. Um, and so people, and, and this, P, this PMV model incorporates air temperature, humidity, uh, flow rates, even the clothing level of the people and the metabolism of the people as input parameters to this model. So we think, okay, as engineers and, 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 and as researchers, um, what, else, what else is there that can influence people's comfort besides those factors? Well, what about age and, and gender differences? Um, so there's another study that showed that it was a literature review and looking at all the different studies and trying to figure out are, are, is gender or age related in how we interpret thermal comfort? And they, there's no consensus. Like if there are a few, there are several studies that show that gender is a significant uh, factor in comfort. And there's just as many that say that it's weak or insignificant um, in both chamber and field studies. Age is the same way. In fact, they, there's a few that say it's significant, a few say it's weak, and a few that say it's ins insignificant. So it's, it's, the, the jury is still out in terms of what are, what's causing comfort uh, problems. Well, one of the things that we decided to do was um, try to figure out what are all the factors that can influence our, our satisfaction in the built environment. So, so one of the postdocs on my team, uh, Dr. Jayatissa, put together this graphic to, to try to go through all the literature and figure out what are all the things that are making us feel uh, too warm or too cold, but also visual comfort. So glare and, and light levels and also noise. And so how does noise impact us? And this visualization shows that there are dozens of things. It's not just temperature, humidity, and, and air movement for thermal comfort. There's metabolic rate, there's heat sources, vascular anatomy, physical activity, circadian clock. I mean, there's just diet-induced thermogenesis. So what we eat can actually influence how we feel about, about our thermal comfort. So how can we create a sensor? How can we deploy all of this many sensors in the built environment to understand people's comfort? The, the answer to that is we probably can't. And so we, we, we thought, let's think about this from a different perspective when it comes to, to machine learning or, or trying to understand how people feel. So in the marketing and advertising field, let's, let's try to learn from them. What do they do when they look at trying to figure out what people want? Well, in marketing and advertising, to figure out what people want, you have a product and you're trying to find the people in the market who want to buy your product. You want to optimize that process. You want to target them with ads or things like that. 
So what do you do? So you basically collect information that allows you to figure out if they're a good candidate for your product. You, you know, you collect data from them using, you know, surveys and things. You can observe their spending habits, which if you're a, a, a retailer, you could actually see what they've bought in the past. You can even use IOT and, and wearables and, you know, your refrigerator detecting whether you have milk or not and, and, and suggesting that you order that. That's another area. Um, but the biggest thing that's happened in, in, in marketing and advertising is, of course, social media and online data collection. So you basically are allowing people to um, give feedback. So likes and thumbs up and star ratings. And, and you're basically using that in retail to figure out, is this person a good match for this product? So in the building industry, in architecture and engineering and design and real estate, what, what is our product? Well, our product is a space. We're creating a space for people. And does that space meet the person's needs? Is it a good space for them? And a lot of us have seen how like COVID-19 has changed the way we use spaces. We have, uh, we don't just go into our office and sit at our desk every day from nine to five. We have a choice. We can stay at home. We can go to the office. We can go to different maybe places in the office if it's a flexible based workspace. So how can we start matching people to spaces that, that meet their needs? Well, we, in our industry, we use post-occupancy evaluations, we use occupancy detection, we even sometimes use IoT and wearables and things like that. But the thing that's really missing is the like button. How do we get a like button for spaces? And how do we do that in a way that's not just people calling and saying, hey, I don't, this space is too cold or whatever. And how can you collect information from people without making it into a complaint, basically. You don't, you don't wanna just hear when people are uncomfortable enough to complain, you wanna hear the nuances between comfortable and uncomfortable. So how do we create a like button for spaces? How do we create a star rating for spaces? And, and how can we do that in the built environment where every space we have what's called spatial and temporal uh, in, in increased diversity in these areas? meaning that our feedback only really matters when we're in a certain space. So we, we created a platform called Cozy. Uh, Cozy is a, a smartwatch-based uh, app that allows people to indicate on their watch how they're feeling. And we can use that information to uh, understand in, 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 a, in a what's called in, intensive longitudinal way, meaning we collect a lot of data from one person over the course of days or weeks. Um, we, can, we can actually collect that type of information from the built environment. So from the research perspective, this is, this is something that's uh, a technique that's called EMA or ecological momentary assessments. This is really, uh, this technique was really invented and, and pioneered in medicine, psychology, marketing, and things like that, where we're trying to collect information from people as they feel in, in the context that they're feeling it. So when they feel the sensation, we ask them about how they feel it. Um, so we, we developed this app to do this, this watch face. We, we deployed it in NUS. Um, here's kind of the first pilot launch where we had 15 participants. And they were, uh, you can see the heat maps, heat maps at the top where they were kind of in different parts of campus and they were giving feedback and they actually were having sensors attached to their watches as well which were able to tell us what the temperature and heart rate and humidity is where, where they were in those spaces. The next deployment we did, we, we tried to combine Fitbit information with uh, sensors on the, the person, but also combine that with what's called indoor localization. So we tried to combine it with uh, Bluetooth localization. So we knew exactly where the person was inside of a building. We know which floor they're on. And so when they leave feedback or when we collect data from them, we know exactly the spot where, where that happens. And so here's kind of an example of some of the questions that, that can be asked. Uh, we have a library now of over 40 or 50 questions. Uh, these are the ones that are really simple related to thermal, visual, and noise-based feedback. But we, we're starting to create questions that are asking things about how people feel uh, with respect to distractions or um, uh, privacy, or even do they feel like the space is too dense because of uh, COVID restrictions, we can't have too high of a density. So this is a really interesting platform. Um, and the results are not, I mean, we're still in the process of creating these machine learning models to, to leverage these results in the same way that the retail industry does. 
um, to be able to create um, understandings of the spaces, but also be able to nudge people to spaces that are going to make them feel comfortable. So here's a visualization of our SDE4 building, which I believe um, Prof, uh, our Dean, Prof Lam Kipo, was one of your speakers a few weeks back. He probably talked to you about the SDE4 building. Um, so we collected data all across this building. The point cloud that you can see on the top is all the places where we collected these data. Um, so this is a really interesting project that um, a few design firms in the US and have, have been very interested in learning about how to use this platform. Um, so this is becoming a big thing in the United States where uh, design firms are thinking about offering post-occupancy analysis uh, as a service. So you design the building, but you also follow up with an analysis of how that building performs. So this is something that's kind of new, and, and these are the kind of tools and research that can potentially help uh, with that effort. Uh, so you can check out Cozy. You can, if you have a Fitbit uh, smartwatch version, uh, which is the Versa or the uh, the new Fitbit Sense, you can actually download the, the app from the Fitbit gallery from our website. You can also check out the source code, the documentation. Um, and then also we are releasing soon uh, an iOS version for the Apple Watch as well. So this is really exciting because Apple Watch gives us a few more capabilities of creating basically like a chat box uh, or a chat sort of app. It's, it's almost like uh, it's more interactive, ask questions back and forth uh, using Apple Watch. And so we'll have a demo of this within a year or two. So if you come visit us at NUS, you'll, you can see a demo of that. Okay, so I don't wanna talk anymore about all these really technical fancy ML models, especially if you're not familiar with machine learning. Um, it seems all kind of abstract and far away and really cool, but you know, I don't, you know, when am I ever gonna sit down and, and use or do those things? So I wanna talk a lot about now about skills. I wanna talk about the development of skills in the direction of data science and programming and machine learning. So fancy machine learning models and data collection, that's all great, Prof Miller, I, I get that. But how can I learn these things? What, what are, how can I get started in learning, this, in, in learning these things? So I've done a lot of interviews over the last, uh, yeah, 10 years or so since I started uh, my PhD or even before I did my PhD. And I've talked to a lot of uh, industry uh, experts. So here's a bunch of logos. Some of them are from Singapore, some are from the US. A lot of them are university campuses. I, I went and talked to the facilities management and the, and the design and the architecture teams of these campuses and these different organizations. And they all said very similar things. They said, we have lots of data, we have building information models, we have energy management systems, we have all of these different systems creating data, but no one really uses those data after the initial reason that the, the data was created. So BIM models, as soon as the building is built, we put the BIM models in a, on a hard drive and we put it in the desk drawer, right? So how can we use these data? Well, nobody really knows, nobody really knows how to do it. They think maybe there's some value in, in data from the building industry, but you know, that's something that uh, maybe we need machine learning or data science experts to help us with. Maybe that's what we should do. We should hire a bunch of data scientists. Well, the problem is that it's difficult. Uh, well, second, the second point here, it's difficult to find good data scientists at all. They're in high demand, they're, they're paid very high amounts of money. They usually go into the tech sector uh, in the existing industries like, like retail and advertising. Um, and so on the flip side, so it's hard to find data scientists. On the flip side, there's not many people in our industry, architects and engineers, who have skills in that path. We don't teach, usually don't teach coding in, in our degree programs. That's changing, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, but we usually don't. So people in the building industry who wanna learn how to code often have to do it on their own. But I found over and over again that a lot of these organizations that I've talked to would encourage their own employees to learn or even pay for education related to data science to learn these skills. And, and, and there's, it hasn't happened yet, but I can see the future where having these skills will be able, you'll be able to differentiate yourself in the market as an engineer or architect or uh, facilities manager who knows how to code. So I tell my students, I say, I'm going to teach you how to code because I want you to be able to automate things. I want you to be able to work with large data sets. This was, is something that can help future proof your skill set. 
And a lot of people talk about how AI may replace parts of the, you know, of different industries. But if you learn how to use AI, if you learn how to code, you won't be replaced. You'll be writing that code that, that, that helps you. And I also don't believe that AI is going to, is going to revel, is going to, is going to, um, remove whole industries or, or professions. I think it's going to change professions. I think in 30 years from now, architects will be doing slightly different things. They won't be drafting as much. They'll be basically using their decision-making skills to, 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 to select designs based on what AI has helped them build. But, uh, you know, generating designs using just robots is, is, is I don't think is, is in, the, is in the path. The, the, ana the analogy is accountants. Accountants 20, 30 years ago didn't have computers or maybe 40 years ago didn't have computers and they counted, they, they literally added up numbers. Now we still have accountants, even though we have computers, they just have a different type of job. So architects and engineering, I think is the same thing, but learning how to code is definitely gonna help you understand that transition. So in the building, uh, Department of Building and NUS, I teach a class called Digital Construction. I co-teach this class and we teach Python. We teach Python and pandas and, and coding and machine learning to undergraduates that are not computer scientists, not even engineers. They are in a program called Project and Facilities Management, which is related to architecture, but more on the PM side. Um, we now have a new uh, master's course in our Building Performance and Sustainability program, master's program called Data Science for the Built Environment, which is on, we're on our second run of this course. And we're teaching uh, to, um, yeah, to, to graduate level students, uh, data science. <clears throat> so I am super motivated for, for people in our industry to learn data science and these skills. So I created these two classes, but for me, that wasn't, that's not good enough. I want to be able to, uh, these skills to be across the, the whole industry if possible. So there's something called massive open online courses or edX courses. Um, and you can go on there and you can find uh, courses like Python basics for data science, Python for everybody. And these are really generic uh, uh, courses where you can learn how to program. But I think that my hypothesis was or is that learning how to code is a lot better and more fun and more motivating if you're learning within your context, if you're learning within your maybe in within your industry, because the skills you might learn and the data that you have seen the, the, the skills applied to makes more sense to you. It's more useful or interesting potentially. So because of this, I created and launched in, in April of this year, uh, an edX course called Data Science for Construction, Architecture and Engineering. And this course is designed to teach coding to these professions in the context of buildings, in the design, construction and operation phases of buildings. It is a approximately seven week course um, that will launch again in the end of September. So in about a week and a half, we'll be launching again. And this launch will be actually a six month launch. So you can sign up um, and you can take the course over the, the course of um, any time between now and basically March of next year. Um, there's two ways you can do it. You can do it for free as an audit member or audit user. Um, and it's completely free. You sign up and you can watch all the videos and learn and follow along. You can also take what's called the verified track where at the end, you'll actually receive a certificate of completion and you'll be taking uh, various quizzes and evaluations to achieve that. And that's actually a paid track. So if you want to go down that track, um, maybe if your company wants to invest or, or help support that, that's great. So either way, you can take it either way. The verified track just allows you to create, to have a certificate at the end of, of, a, of accomplishment. So I highly encourage everyone to check this out. Even if you just check it out and realize it's not for you, check it out, tell your friends. Um, I, I'm really on a mission to, to you know, for this course to be, um, um, to, to, to try to change the industry in this direction of, of learning these skills. So the demographics of the course, it's usually uh, people in their late uh, 20s, early 30s, but we, we do have uh, quite a few people in the later stages of their career as well. Um, so please join in. It's never too late to learn a new skill. Um, geography wise, most of the people in the course are from uh, United States, India, or Singapore, but there are quite a few people from uh, Indonesia, Philippines, uh, Vietnam, Australia. So like regionally, there's, there's also quite a few people. So, 
So check it out. And I, for me, the, the biggest uh, reward of this whole thing is not just seeing the industry change, but seeing how maybe it changes people's career paths. So here's a couple um, um, feedback sort of uh, feedback that I got from a couple users um, where they really felt like this was a, a course curated for this industry that they really appreciated. Um, so, so hopefully that, that inspires you as well. So uh, with that, uh, that's, that's all I have for today. Thanks uh, for your attention uh, and time. I hope this was useful. And I believe that we have about 12 minutes for questions and answers. And once again, if you want to download these slides, you can scan this QR code or uh, just put that link uh, in your browser. Thanks a lot. All right. Well, yes. Uh, thank you, Dr. Clayton, for the, that lecture. And I believe that yes, uh, there are there are several questions uh, that uh, our some of our participants would like to ask you. And um, let's just go over the first question here uh, from UAP Singapore, uh, Jay Mendoza. It says, while the advantages, indeed the necessity of data science for the built environment is unquestionable in so far as multi-level and large scale structures are concerned, what impact do such advanced methodologies have on small scale, low cost construction, for example, single family residences in developing countries? That, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, so, I think the, the the I don't have actually don't have a great response for that in a sense of uh, I can't think of a specific context or application in that area. But that to me that is the biggest challenge is to figure out we we can all learn these skills and we can learn about these fancy techniques. How do we apply them? And so in my team we have figured out different applications for data science and machine learning. Um, but that's actually the hard part. That's actually the harder part than actually learning the skills is how do we use those skills? How do we change the business models, let's say? So a lot of the stuff that we deal with is bigger, like really big companies um, that have, you know, let's say they have thousands of, of clients or buildings. How can they use machine learning to be able to impact their, their efficiency, their time efficiency? How can they scale their techniques across large portfolios? On a smaller, you know, single family residence in a developing country kind of context, there's got to be, there's got to be an application. I can't, I can't, like I said, I'm, I, yeah, I, this is a, it's a great question. I think there is something there, but that's the hard part is finding how this, these skill, these techniques can be applied. And there's a really, really nice book that I, I, I um, would suggest people read. It's called Prediction Machines. And Prediction Machines, it's a book that's very simple and easy to read, but it, it talks about this. How do we just, how do we apply things in our context? So I would have to stop and think about your question before, I mean, we could have like a, a brainstorming at some point maybe, but, but really understanding how things can be applied is the hard part. So I, I, I didn't really answer your question, but I, I, I want, yeah, that is a really interesting question because that, that is the hard part, so. Okay. Well, I guess, yeah, that will be helpful. So we at least uh, consider uh, making the, you know, the, the structure uh, very flexible for both yeah. for large and small scale cool. um, yeah, group. Now, another question, uh, Dr. Clayton, it says here from architect Mike Guerrero from UAP Makati Greenbelt chapter, how long does it normally take for the data you collect translate to user-friendly pragmatic guidelines? And is there hope for people that grew, with, grew up without computers to learn code? So the first part of the question ties back to the last question, which is the, this whole, you know, you, let's say we have tons of raw data, we apply all these fancy techniques, what is the use of that? So this, this first part of this question goes into that. How do we translate that into, let's say, feedback for designers? Let's say uh, new thermal comfort standards. It takes, the, the answer to the question is it takes a long time. It does take, well, once somebody discovers that process, then, it, then it's much faster, but it, it takes a long time to figure that out. The second part of the question, and, and, and just so you know, like a lot of our research projects, we're getting close to figuring out things that can be easily put into um, a, a standard. And that's what ASHRAE is also very interested in, which is what we're working with. 
So the answer to the first part of the question is it, it does, it takes a long time. The second part is, yes, I do think that, that people, it, it depends if you, if you don't have a lot of programming or, or even computer experience in the past, I've seen tons of people in my classes pick up coding really fast because of the tools and the, and the types of programming languages that are out there that are easier to use. However, it, it really depends on the person. Some people love it. They pick it up really fast, even though they don't have a ton of experience. Some people really struggle. It's really difficult and it doesn't make sense. So it, it, it's, it's like, it's like uh, any skill or any talent. It's like, you know, riding a bike or running or, or doing anything. Some people have more natural talent than others and pick it up much faster. So it, it's, it just depends on who you are. Like, but, but I, I tell my students that coding is not everything. In fact, the communication of results is also just as important. So if you're not as good at coding and you don't want to learn, even want to learn how to code, it's knowing what coding can do and working with the coders to bring uh, this type of information into the, into the context and change the context through uh, communication and, and really, yeah, bridging the gap between the building industry and the coding. So you don't have to code to be a part of that. So. Okay. Well, that's good to know. <laughs> at yeah. least uh, at, you just know the concept of coding, then that will work for you. All right. So, okay. Another question. I think this is coming from our second speaker himself, uh, architect Edgardo Malieri. He wants to know if uh, the building and data science program at the National University of Singapore accessible to Filipinos? Yes, yes. So, so the, the online course, the edX course is the best way to, to be exposed to the, to our group and to the skills and all these things. Um, it's, yeah, we've had lots of people from the Philippines, um, participate in the course online. It's fully online. Um, and there are, I think even edX even offers, uh, if you want to take the verified track, they do offer scholarships, I believe, within the platform. I don't have control over that. You, you kind of go through a system of asking uh, within edX. Um, so there are ways that you can get verified tracks without, uh, at a discount. Um, so that, that, that's based on, based on need or, or geography or things like that. So that course is really the best first stop if you find that you're, you're, you, you, some light has come on and you really enjoy what you see in our course, you can, uh, we have a master's program in NUS if you wanna to come to Singapore and study. But also if you're willing to wait, we're actually planning a few new uh, um, online uh, courses which build upon this first course. So there's another professor in my department who's, who's GIS, he's a GIS expert and he's looking at urban scale analytics as of course. There's another course that's looking at energy modeling and energy simulation as applied to data science. And then we're also trying to work with some of the architecture faculty to figure out, and, and actually, you know what, there is another edX course from NUS that focuses on generative and, and, and yeah, generative design for architects. Um, there's a professor named Patrick Jansen who has his own edX course. There's actually four courses. And I would highly encourage you to check those out if you're from, you're more on the really on the design side. So within NUS, there's actually, I think, six courses or seven courses, and, and all of those except one are in architecture and the built environment. So, they're, so check out the NUS um, edX platform. That's a great place to start. Okay, that's very interesting to know. At least maybe through President Mark, uh, he can update and keep everyone posted about the upcoming uh, courses, on online courses. Yeah. Okay, and uh, let's go back to the third question. It says, does the algorithm helps uh, or help us in designing spaces in architecture, interior design and landscape design better with regard to the ongoing problem with climate change? And does the program have human touch from UAP Singapore architect Mylon Usbal? That's a great question. Um, so I've been doing, I'm not, I'm not quite as deep into the machine learning for design side I, I, in terms of my research, but I do try to keep updated on it because of the course. And, and so there's a whole field now in research and architecture called generative design. So if you, you can Google that and you can learn more or in, our, in my course, I cover that in some of the, the videos. Generative design is not just for buildings. I think in all of design 
fields, generative design is becoming a topic. It's where an AI algorithm is, is basically creating designs. It's, it's, you, you create parameters and you throw it into a model and it creates a whole bunch of different forms and it, you know, kind of this algorithm is creating all these designs. So there's a lot of, uh, and, and the design community is figuring out how to use that in the context of real projects. The problem is the, the algorithms are not, human, humans are not good as good at predicting as algorithms, but we are much better at making what's called judgment. So there's a difference between judgment and prediction. So algorithms can predict and they can create and generate, but he, only humans can process the, um, the, the, like your client. Your client is not going to take a design from an algorithm in the same way that you're not going to take uh, your diagnosis from a, from a machine, you're, you want a doctor, right? You want a doctor to look at the results that maybe a model or AI would create, and then they would use their judgment to interpret that for a human. So we're, we're not gonna get rid of architects any sooner than we're gonna get rid of doctors. I think that humans understand other humans and you can't build models to understand all the nuances of how humans feel and think and what their priorities are. So. So, so, like I said, the book called Prediction Machines is a great book to understand that difference between prediction and judgment and why humans are so much better than machines. Um, and so, and also check out Generative Design Field and learn about how that's working because it's, it's really interesting and it's, it's a cool part of the future. Um, so, yeah, so check that out. Okay, so I guess in other words, you're saying that one can't stand alone without the other one. So... They're exactly. making a perfect team. Okay. Exactly. All right. Well, Press Mark, do we have a, a few more questions for Dr. Clayton? I think it's okay already. Okay. Well, if that is the case, well, Dr. Clayton, on behalf of everyone here today, um, I'd like to thank you, you know, for taking the time to speak to us. And um, I guess your insights into data science for the building industry and how it is impacting the lives of so many people was very remarkable. And personally, um, one takeaway I will remember is um, when you said that sound matters and that architects need to consider designing for our ears, you know, because the quality of the acoustics of a space affect us physiologically, socially, psychologically, and, you know, behaviorally. So, yeah, I think everyone has already got their time worth from all the information you just shared with us this afternoon. So, yeah, thank you. And having... Okay, thank you. And having said that, um, Dr. Clayton, we'd like to present to you uh, a virtual certificate of appreciation for um, joining us this afternoon. Uh, let me read what's written on the certificate. Uh, it says, United Architects of the Philippines, Union ng mga Arkitekto ng Pilipinas, Singapore Chapter. Certificate of Appreciation is hereby presented to Dr. Clayton Miller, Assistant Professor, Department of Building, School of Design and Environment, National University of Singapore, for imparting his valuable insights and inspiration as the webinar speaker during the 14th UAP Singapore Seminar with the theme Green Architecture, the impact on the living environment, data science for the building industry, research and skills that will change the industry. Given this 19th of September 2020, Singapore signed architect Mark Lester Alcantara Valignota, UAP President, UAP Singapore Chapter, and of course co-signed by architect Luisito Domalaon, UAP District Director, UAP Regional B1. In behalf of the group, we'd like to uh, award this certificate. Please accept uh, Dr. Clayton. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Jonathan. That, I appreciate that, and I'm happy to uh, to be here and to give you this information and, and thanks. Yeah, I, I appreciate the certificate of appreciation. It is our immense pleasure. And again, guys, if you want to catch uh, Dr. Clayton, I believe the uh, the QR code has been uh, shared earlier on. So if you want to also check out um, some of his uh, ongoing programs and studies and uh, researches, uh, can we find you um, on Google or somewhere else? Uh, where can we catch you, Dr. Clayton? Uh, I think the best way I, I had a, a, my email address that was was flashed on that last slide as as well. That so so sending me an email is good, but li LinkedIn is also a good place if you find me on LinkedIn, uh, Clayton Miller, and and just add me or send me messages if you're interested. That's another good place to to find me. All right. Well, sounds good. Thank you once again, and we'll catch you later. Okay. Great. Thanks, everybody. 
Thank you, Dr. Clayton. And uh, we would like also to thank uh, architect, I'm sorry, Dr. Sheila Conejos for connecting Dr. Clayton to UAP Singapore chapter and to NUS uh, Singapore. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay, and at this point, uh, to all our participants, guys, we are about to proceed to our next speaker. So as mentioned, uh, from a speaker from the West, we are now uh, ready to listen to a Southeast Asian, our very own pride. And uh, he is uh, our next speaker who took up architecture in Mapua Institute of Technology and further graduated at the Technolo Technological Institute of the Philippines. He has his Master's of Technology Management a candidate, Information Technology Project Management, which is uh, pending completion of comprehensive examination. He is also an architect and planning professional who is able to work on the complete spectrum of architectural service from concept to project turnover using digital and traditional tools. Project management is also a key skill offered as an extension of work as an architect. So a graduate program in technology management fortified his skills in the area of planning, developing and implementing technological capabilities to shape and accomplish the strategic and operational goals of an organization. Currently, he is the lead architect of GN Power Limited Company and principal architect of ELM or Elm Arc. And I'm very much confident that this guy will bring a lot of things to our group today. Friends, please all welcome architect Edgardo Maliari, UAP, Green AP. Hello everyone, good evening. Uh, it's the evening already. Good evening everyone and good evening uh, UAP Singapore and the rest of the UAP chapters that are represented here. Uh, how's everyone? Uh, I miss Singapore. Uh, we were there last year for uh, BEX Asia and we already bought tickets for the trip this year. So you know what happened, uh, we all know what happened and uh, so um, yeah, we're stuck in, I'm stuck in the Philippines and I'm stuck here in my town. Uh, Singapore is close to my heart as I used to work there. And that is, where, that is where I bonded closer with my college friend. One of which is your second chapter president from 2010 to 2012, no other than architect Franz Gonzalez. Uh, is he here? Uh, is Franz here in, in, in this event? Uh, okay, anyway, uh, hi to France if, if he is here. Um, I was told that you'd be sending me a physical certificate. Is that right? Uh, if that is right, uh, okay, please include a tapa of char great cha with it uh, uh, because I definitely miss that, that, that food, okay? I represent Green AP, uh, Green Architecture Advocacy Philippines, and at the same time, I also represent uh, the UAP Rizal Tai Tai chapter. Mm -hmm. okay, uh, uh, towards zero carbon buildings, uh, my talk uh, would kind of be on the opposite end of the building and data science talk by Dr. Clayton. Machine learning is quite a nosebleed for an architect like me, but I recognize its vital role in architecture where we see the need to work with other stakeholders on this such as our scientists. Now that uh, in Green AP, we're talking about climate smart buildings. We, we Again, we recognize the need to work with building and data scientists. By the end of this talk, I hope you hear the same call that I heard, an urgent call to act, to feel the need to do something. We can take baby steps. We definitely can take giant steps, but the important thing is we need to move. We need to be challenged to skill up, to tool up, and we need a green action plan. As design professionals, we need to keep asking, where do we go from here? How can we get involved? What gaps need to be filled? We need to look at what we have left of nature to see what we need to keep, not just for ourselves, but for the next generation. Okay, this talk will be divided into four parts and here's what to expect. Uh, we have the usual inter introduction as part one and then we'll go to the presentation of a case study towards zero carbon buildings. 
we'll sort of uh, we'll, we'll, we'll look into the, the details of the CCR cottage, its design and technology. And then we'll head to the conclusion with this the green action plan. Okay, uh, traditional buildings in the Philippines has evolved around bamboo, wood, nipa, coconut, bricks, and stone. These materials represent building solutions that adapt to our tropical climate and were carbon neutral. Site contextual, I would say. You know, I grew up in a Bahay Kubo, slept inside a Colombo on a Banig sleeping mat over a bamboo slat flooring. Talk about cross ventilation and passive cooling. However, through the years, modernization brought about new building mat materials such as steel and cement, contributing to the high level of carbon in the world. What can we do? We need to build better and we need to build stronger. Because of the advancement in technology, we now design and build like this because of parametric modeling. And also because of other advanced technology, because of the advancement in technology, we now design and build like this. Oops, apologies for misplacing my bike helmet in there. You see, building forms have become so dynamic that boundaries between buildings and products have now been blurred. So from this building form, you can actually superimpose a bike helmet such as this. Giant design firms, star architects now use proprietary algorithms to generate awesome building forms based on design influences and other such parameters. Building design is increasing in complexity at an exponential rate. And so is the need for more complex materials which will lend themselves well to the architect's whims and desires. This by the way is an art piece of the late uh, Zaha Hadid. Even uh, her, her art pieces are geometric and are pretty complex. Uh, Now, uh, now let us consider this question. Algorithms generate building forms, but do they make architecture? This is a question for us to ponder on, but with data science discussed earlier by Dr. Clayton, the considerations would be now different. Maybe algorithms will, will be useful to architects after all. Meanwhile, there is no escaping the truth that our natural resources are getting depleted rapidly. We are losing precious materials day by day. And you know what? This pandemic did not did no good to plants and trees either, especially in the, in the forest and in their natural habitats. We, I hope we know about the plantitas and plantitas who turned to gardening as a way to pass time in lockdown and now they have a clamor to acquire exotic plants. They would pay as much as 3,500 pesos for a rubber leaf branch no longer than four feet. Rampant poaching of these plants from the forest is now being dubbed as a plantdemic. Imagine, from a pandemic to a plantdemic. People say that the information age is gone. Today, sustainability is a big business. And some observers point to this as the performative age in which big data and big software can track and analyze how well each square inch of a building pushes environmental, structural, and material standards of excellence to new heights. We want everything to be measurable now. We want to be energy efficient. But the question for all of us here is, do we need such excess? Considering all the buildings here and uh, without any offense meant to all the designers. As mere mortals with finite minds, even as design professionals, can we still grasp the thought, the language, the experience, the supposed presence of these buildings? Again, a question for us to ponder on. 
there is a need to revisit our carbon neutral past and project to our future using a fusion of current technology with our traditional technology. I guess my position is, can we slow down a bit? Can we design something that we still understand? Something that we can still relate to? Take a break from high technology? As I told you earlier, my, my, my talk would be kind of in the other end of the, the spectrum of what uh, Dr. Clayton talked about earlier. So with that, maybe we can consider appropriate technology. And this appropriate technology is defined as environmentally sound and affordable technical and institutional solutions adapted to human needs and environmental conditions. They are sustainable solutions that are urgently needed, not only for developed countries, but also for developing countries such as the Philippines. Do sustainable solutions have to be big to have an impact? Do they have to be huge? Do they have to be gigantic? So now let us look at a small project which have a huge impact. I now present to you a case study on the zero carbon resorts project uh, about building energy autonomous resort, creating appropriate technology solutions. The zero carbon research project within the European Union Switch Asia project was initiated by the Center for Appropriate Technology or GRAT out of Austria. Uh, the sole purpose is to build up capacity for designing and operating energy autonomous resorts, guiding the way step by step and implementing a long-term change that is sustainable. A multiple stakeholder approach is needed for that change. You see, not only were small and medium-sized hotels and resorts addressed directly, but also tourists, local residents, technical and design experts such as us, professionals in the energy sector and in the tourism industry, as well as governmental bodies and NGOs in the Philippines were also actively involved. It sounds holistic enough for me. Uh, with a common goal to conserve and to recover the environmentally sensitive tourism places such as Palawan and at the same time to enable businesses that are sustainable. This was implemented by our European neighbors from Austria in collaboration, in, in collaboration with the Department of Tourism, the PCSD and uh, Switch Asia. Okay. One of the sectors in the country that is largely dependent on energy, as we know, is tourism. Tourism at its form, tourism at it is, is, forms a vital part of the Philippine economy and is a promising contributor to the generation of foreign exchange earnings, and investments, revenue and employment, and to the growth of the country's output. It is a timely opportunity to affect initiatives which will lessen our expenditure of energy and therefore reduce our carbon emission. Uh, here's how it was done using the 3R approach of the CCR proponent. Through the DOT, the CCR proponents enlisted resort owners and operators again in Puerto Princesa, Coron and El Nido. And these participants were called the frontier group. Palawan, as we, now, as we know, being one of the many prime spots we have for tourism. These key actions were done for the three R's. Again, the reduce, replace, and redesign phase. For number one, uh, which is the reduce phase, briefing sessions for tourism, small, medium enterprises, basic training course for engineers, their consultants, their architects, and their technicians, guest survey on energy consumption behavior and energy audits and monitoring were done in the Frontier Group hotel resorts, implementation of technical solutions and installation of smart metering systems uh, were also deploy, deployed together with cost control and a presentation carbon emission calculation. 
the first CCR conference where media reports were shared and interviews uh, was also done. Simple measures were introduced and disseminated such as uh, simple measures such as turning off the lights and air conditioners as guests leave their hotel rooms, closing the windows where, when ACs are on. How many of us tourists are guilty of leaving the air conditioners on although we are out shopping? Because we want to come back uh, uh, having a really cold room when we come back to the hotel room. Simple measures such as reusing the towels, fixing faulty electrical wirings, proper orientation of the solar panels to the sound to maximize capture of the morning and afternoon sun, and the proper tilt angle of the PV cells were also disseminated during this number one, which is the reduced space. Basically for the reduced space, CCR identified common problems and introduced simple solutions. For the second phase, the replace phase, the savings earned from the phase number one were used to replace obsolete technologies such as incandescent bulbs to LED lamps. Yes, during that time, there are still hotels using incandescent bulbs. Would you believe that? Only in the Philippines. Key cards that automatically shut off power when guests leave the room were also bought in this replaced space and material recovery facilities, solar water heating were also introduced. And finally, in the redesign phase where, this is where we, uh, design pro professionals were involved. Uh, well, uh, design professionals from all over were gathered for a three day workshop to come up with a design for a zero carbon resort cottage prototype. A design competition among participants from all over the world was held in that three day workshop. Fortunately, our team, mostly green architecture advocacy Philippine members was able to mentored by one of the speaker lecturers, architect Mike Guerrero. I believe my architect Mike Guerrero is also in this event. Uh, uh, I saw him as one of the, part in, in the participants list. So again, thank you to Mike Guerrero for ably uh, mentoring us so that we won this, this award for the redesign phase. Um, our design won first place and it was implemented later on in the project phase. Uh, so this is, uh, I present to you our design for that uh, uh, design phase. Uh, again, this design was, was generated by a group of architects, uh, architect Guillermo, architect Reyes, myself, architect Bautista, architect Darotan, and architect Granados. Again, with uh, the mentoring of our very own, our architect Mike Guerrero. Okay, uh, the application of the CCR methods in the Philippines has led to annual savings of 241 million, 878,143.41, which includes savings of 17,712,976.20 kilowatt hours of energy. And uh, 1,776,733 liters of fuel and 476,824,036 uh, liters of water. The carbon emissions avoided because of this zero carbon resort project amounted to 11,860,373 kilograms of carbon dioxide, which can offset the emissions of 5,640 cars in Manila. Reasons for these significant improvements were alternative ways to achieve thermal comfort, identification and elimination of energy and resource wastage, and, and a smart real realization of energy services. Again, sharing the, the, the savings that uh, were realized in the zero carbon resort uh, program. 
Okay, uh, let, let's now zoom in on the part three of the redesign process, the, the three R's. The zero carbon resort cottage is a showcase to demonstrate the feasibility of an innovative building concept that significantly reduces uh, carbon dioxide emissions and demonstrate resource efficient solutions in the building sector using indigenous and locally available materials. For this end, a highly resource and energy efficient building has been built in Puerto Princesa, Palawan. A project whose, promone, whose proponent expressly told us that he does not want a Bahay Kubo. And you know what we gave him? A Bahay Kubo. See, architects are really uh, stubborn. Uh, if you have been following Green 80s lectures, by now you would be familiar with uh, architect Mike Guerrero's 10 steps to sustainability. Well, we simply apply those fundamental but important principles in this project and we have for ourselves this zero carbon resort cottage. Uh, after being commissioned to be the executive architect of the project, my design firm proceeded to generate the actual working drawings. So we're now looking at the site development plan. The, the building is, is a, oriented towards the north-south axis, such that um, uh, the, the PB cells on the roof are naturally oriented look uh, towards the south, uh, maximizing the efficiency of these PB cells. Uh, you're looking at a butterfly roofing such that the, 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 the gutter is in the middle, uh, tilted towards this end so that uh, rainwater can be uh, efficiently collected. Uh, if, it's, if the drawings are clear to you from the Northeast to the Southwest, uh, we employ the uh, breezeways so that the, the amias and our habagats can be properly channeled towards the building, which by the way has walls that actually breathe, meaning allowing airs, air to go inside and outside the building, the building, of course, efficiently filtered by uh, insects uh, filtered. The building is resting on, a, on point foundations, uh, concrete plates, uh, isolated uh, concrete footings connected via uh, steel uh, connectors to the uh, bamboo columns. The reason why we, we wanted to, to, to put uh, this building on, on stilts is because by the end of the life cycle of the building, since it's a demonstra demonstration cottage only, we want to be able to take back the raw land that, that, uh, from which it's, it stands upon. Uh, okay, uh, so we're now looking at a simple plan of the build of the zero carbon resort cottage. Uh, the building footprint is no bigger than 88 square meters. From the northeast, you go up to this viewing deck, and then you go in to, to the living room, open plan, and then a small dining area with a small kitchen. Uh, the north end houses the the north end, the coolest end, houses the bedroom suite, which is divided by this ramp at wall, a thermal mass that uh, at any given point of the day is cool, so that at night it will exude for us uh, uh, cool air. Um, uh, this is the ornate um, uh, ceiling that uh, we designed for the building, again, making use of bamboo as the, the basic raw material. We're now looking at the roof plan of the building again, showing the, the, the butterfly roofing that, that uh, slopes from this end towards the, this uh, gutter and from this end towards this gutter, which, which is uh, tilted at a slope uh, towards this direction. Uh, um, draining into this rainwater collection tank. EB cells are here uh, because of the natural location to, to maximize the collection of uh, solar energy and also the solar water heater is located in this area. I want uh, this time I want to show you the elevations of the building, uh, front elevation facing east, uh, 
we are looking in this section, uh, what we call uh, door, door windows, meaning, meaning when, when closed, when the doors are closed, this, window, this actually acts as awning windows because this, this, uh, these windows are operable, but you can actually open the entire door to, 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 to into a, a, an open uh, in, uh, internal balcony, okay? Um, so again, this is a left side elevation facing north. The, the, the bedroom, the small bedroom has uh, its own uh, private uh, balcony so that uh, um, the occupants can actually enjoy a privacy in their, in their own balcony. Again, showing the, the, the elevations and section uh, through the building. You can see in, this, in these drawings that uh, we didn't touch the natural uh, grade of the, the site. We built on flint foundations, uh, connected the bamboo poles uh, via steel connectors that are embedded on the concrete plinths. So since we have uh, bamboo slats as flooring, uh, you can just imagine uh, air going in and out of the buildings from the floor and also from the walls. So there's virtually no need for air conditioning in this, in this uh, zero carbon resort cottage. Um, now we're now looking at a typical base section of the, the wall. You can see the, the clasp, uh, the bamboos, the half bamboos clasping into each other so that water will not be able to, to, to penetrate uh, inside the building, but air can actually go in and out of the building to, to possibly cool the zero carbon resort cottage. Obviously, what we see are traditional materials designed with the aid of technology. In this case, building information modeling. We did it, paste, we did it painstakingly set as each bamboo component has to be extruded into a 3D component at that time. Okay, and also uh, we have to work with a physical model because we found out that my young design team cannot visualize uh, the interface between posts, beams, and gears uh, um, and to my surprise that they, 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 their uh, learnings from, the, from their big building technology is not enough for them to visualize uh, this kind of interface uh, needed for this bamboo construction. Okay, uh, so here's uh, the zero carbon res resort cottage now. It's still there, it still stands uh, to this uh, very moment in Puerto Princesa Palawan. Uh, again, obviously all bamboo. It is now a showcase of practical and passive green appropriate technology. Uh, this is uh, the view looking at the main entrance of the building, you go up the staircase going into this uh, uh, bamboo trellis and then going into the main uh, entrance. Again, and on this side, we're looking at uh, the uh, door windows or the, or the wind doors. When open, they are windows, but when, uh, when open, they are doors, but when closed, you can actually open the operable awnings, uh, such as when, when, when when it's raining, okay? So again, a uh, simple use of our awnings uh, that we directly extracted from our Baha'i Kubo principles. Uh, this is the south side of the building where we, uh, this balcony opens up, uh, this, this side opens up to the south. This is where the living room is and this is where the, the small dining room is. Um, uh, here, what I'm showing here are the appropriate technology that was being showcased in this in this uh, demonstration cottage. Of course, we can definitely hide this uh, these technologies in in a discreet way, but because this is a 
a showcase, uh, and this is it is now served as a museum for learning. These are being showcased so that people can can actually learn from can and can actually see and learn from this uh, appropriate technologies. Okay, uh, we're now looking at the, the the lowest end of the butterfly roofing where uh, the rainwater is being collected uh, in this uh, piping. Of course, a uh, uh, leaf eater is, is, is in there so that uh, it will throw away any debris spurs before actually being collected into this tank. Um, obviously, the tank is, is quite uh, invasive, meaning uh, it could have been a better uh, designed tank and uh, it doesn't have to be blue because it's, it's sticking, sticking out like a sore thumb. But these are uh, project partners that, that are being showcased in, in, in this uh, zero carbon resort cottage. Okay. Um, uh, locally sourced bamboo was used in this zero carbon resource Resort cottage as the main building material. Obviously, this is for uh, the purpose of sustainability. Uh, by now, we know that the bamboo's produ prodigious growth rate makes the grass a carbon hungry plant and one of the world's most efficient carbon storage system. The mosso species native to China stores up to 250 tons of carbon per hectare, comparable to trees, but much more cost-effective. Bamboo is also a pioneer plant, meaning it can grow in places no other plants can thrive. This makes it a valuable tool for restabilizing eroded landscapes. and also means that it does not have to compete with food crops for suitable land. And it is strong, so strong that some researchers believe bamboo composites could one day replace steel as the structural reinforcement material of choice in buildings. A shift that would drastically reduce the carbon depth of the construction industry. Bamboo is so strong, yet it is so flexible that this Japan educated Vietnamese architect calls it the green steel of the 21st century. Bamboo is a giant wood-like grass with 80 genera and over 1,200 documented species. There's a lot, there's a lot to choose from. It grows very quickly, as we know, some grow 47 inches in 24 hours and can reach over 100 feet in height within 60 days. It is one of the fastest growing plants in the world with its short growth cycle and a high carbon dioxide exchange rate, bamboo is a good alternative to timber. It has been used for over 7,000 years for many different products such as clothes, arrows, papers, books, baskets, and of course, buildings. Bamboo is a super building material that was celebrated worldwide at yesterday's World Bamboo Day. Did you know that yesterday, September 18, is World Bamboo Day? So what did we do with the bamboo that we use? Bamboo definitely needs uh, uh, bamboo treatment. Since most bamboo species are vulnerable to degrading organisms like insects, this material needs appropriate treatment. A wide range of treatment methods are known to prevent such degradation and to improve bamboo durability. For the CCR cottage, instead of harsh chemicals like boric acid, we opted for a non-toxic treatment. Accordingly, pressure seawater treatment was used for all bamboo poles that we used. What we did is we submerged them in seawater at 30 meters depth for 30 days using counterweights so that they'll stay submerged in water. The equivalent pressure in this depth is four bars or 58 PSI. So proper storing and drying after the soaking process was also observed. Uh, definitely there are other um, treatments to, to preserve bamboo, but, but that is the treatment that we, we chose to, to deploy for this uh, zero carbon resort cottage. 
it would naturally come that even the scaffolds used are also bamboo. Yes, a lot of bamboo were used during the course of this project. In fact, we had a hard time sourcing out bamboos in the later stage of construction. We think we have enough bamboo supply in the Philippines, but actually we don't. There goes a business niche that you might want to look into, bamboo propagation. We can also look at the appropriate technologies that we used for, for this uh, zero carbon resort cottage. Again, we use uh, PB cells, uh, strategically located facing south at uh, certain degrees so that we can maximize the, the uh, collection of solar energy. These are not uh, virtually useless without this uh, uh, control devices, which are located in the ceiling of the house. Uh, um, batteries are also located in the coolest part of the house, which is beneath it. We also use for ourselves tubular solar lighting devices so that uh, during daytime, there won't be a need to, to, to use lights because uh, of these tubular so, uh, solar lighting devices. We also use solar co uh, cooker. Uh, this device on the left uh, collects uh, solar energy, which is then um, used to heat the oil in this uh, in this pan and then uh, when do you want to use it uh, you can uh, be able to use that heat in that oil to cook anything that you want to cook in this in this pan so this is a solar key co uh, cooker uh, technology uh, created specifically for this uh, zero carbon resort cottage demonstration Uh, we also made use of low wattage, high volume pan, just in case uh, it's, it, it's uh, really very hot. Uh, outside during our uh, summer seasons, we made use of these low wattage, high volume pans inside the buildings. And if you look at the floor plan here, uh, those with the green pins are actually pointing to split bamboo wall panels that will actually allow air to go in from from underneath the building from the ceiling, which will naturally ventilate uh, the, the, the building, which will actually move air inside the building, move hot air outside of the building through the, the, the fenestrations above the, the windows. Uh, because uh, we made all, we also made use of the uh, this building monitoring system technology that was uh, uh, installed by the proponent. Uh, virtually from Austria, they can actually see the 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 building performance, the energy efficiency of the building, the temperature inside any given area inside the building because they they, they installed building monitoring system from inside the building. Uh, the, this plan is showing the temperature sensor inside the plan. And um, with this building monitoring system, uh, the, the claim for energy efficiency is, is, is being verified by, by the proponents of this, this project. Uh, aside from uh, uh, the butterfly roofing, uh, in, in, this, in this picture, you can see, we can see the that, that roofing, uh, again, the roofing is also made of bamboo. Uh, water be collect, collected by, by a central uh, valley gutter system. Water is being conserved with this low flow uh, faucets, low flow uh, water closets. Again, water being collected. And instead of the uh, conventional uh, septic tank, uh, we are using uh, the Watson Wake wastewater treatment uh, for this uh, zero carbon resort cottage. So what is the function of the zero carbon resort cottage now? Uh, it shows a minimum of gray energy over its entire life cycle and from production of materials to the use space and the recycling possibilities. This is achieved with a maximum utilization of reg regional renewable sources, which is bamboo and clay. The, uh, I'm showing here the interior of the ZCR cottage, looking at the 
the living room through the these windows looking outside the, the main street. So you can see that this this uh, interior is well ventilated and well lighted. You practically need uh, not uh, turn on any light bulbs during daytime. Uh, this is the same interior view at night using LED bulbs for to light up the interior of the building. And this one is looking at the, the small dining, small, small kitchen through the dining area. There is a small refrigerator because this now serves as a museum. There's practically, practically no need for a refrigerator, but uh, they store uh, cold drinks here for the guests. So there is a mini refrigerator there. Okay, this is the same view at night. Again, uh, showing uh, limited use of uh, LED lights for nighttime use. This one is showcasing the solar tube lighting and the low wattage fan. Because we made use of anahau leaves as a, a soffit for the tad, tad, tad bamboo roofing, we practically do not need the second layer of ceiling, a false ceiling, because the anahau uh, leaves uh, served as ornate ceiling patterns underneath the, the roof. Okay, uh, here we see people uh, interacting with the proponent, Dr. Robert Wimmer, an Austrian, uh, uh, asking questions about uh, the features of the zero carbon resort cottage. And in the background, we see the uh, ramp earth construction that we did, again, uh, with the purpose of using it as a thermal mass to, to cool the inside of the, the building. The, bedroom behind it and the living room and dining room in front of it. The CCR cottage is, is, is now again a showcase for people to see a showcase of sustainability. We are looking at uh, this small toilet inside again with the technologies, the building monitoring system that is hidden behind this uh, bamboo cabinet. The CCR cottage is now, aside from being a museum, a learning center. Okay, uh, far from being a perfect solution for a zero carbon resort building, the CCR cottage is now a learning center for future sustainability advocates, people of all ages come in droves to observe and learn from the demonstration cottage hopefully to improve on its sustainability features and validate its building efficiency claims. So you can see here people of all sorts visiting the building. This is your cottage is a learning center. People going inside the people in the people going inside the building to scrutinize it. People going under the building to look at some of the other features here being showcased is the 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 concrete plinth and the steel connectors were in the bamboo poles uh, uh, sit upon, okay? Uh, it's now a learning center even for small children because it's never too early to get children, our next generation to have the mindset of sustainability. Um, it's a learning center for these small kids. Uh, hopefully they will, uh, we start them young and then it will be imbibed in their uh, passion for sustainability. And uh, hopefully we will have a next generation of natural sustainability leaders. Okay, uh, because of its uh, efficiency and its uh, uh, overall design, uh, the Zero Carbon Resort Demonstration Building won for the proponent of the Global Human Settlements Award in 2015, uh, awarded at the United Nations headquarters in New York. So here we see the, the Austrian proponent, Dr. Wimmer, along with his uh, uh, 
assistant. Aside from being a learning center, again, it is a museum for sustainability because no less than the European Union ambassador, Franz Lesson, Jessen visited the CCR cottage, uh, being proud of the, the product of, of, of the Austrian proponents of this building. Okay, uh, so here are they enjoying the, the cool breeze inside the building. Again, the, museum, the cottage is now a museum for sustainability. If you happen to drop by in Puerto Princesa, it's past the Iwahig, um, uh, Iwahig Penitentiary, right after that, uh, inside the Palawan Council for Sustainability um, Complex. So what is the challenge that I'm trying to, to present here? As architects, there's no doubt we have to be creative. We have to think like this young material engineer. I don't know if you, you know him. I'm not sure some of you does. Uh, Earl Patrick Fortales is not even an architect. He's a materials engineer. Uh, he has designed a modular housing system called Kubo, won the cities for our future competition. His design using indigenous materials could help improve the lives of the million of people living in formal settlements in the Philippines. Yeah, a lot of informal settlers in the Philippines. And with this design uh, by a material uh, scientist, don't you agree that uh, the lives of these informal uh, settlers will be upgraded? So that is a challenge for us. If material engineers can think like architects, definitely architects can think like material engineers too. Also, uh, let us consider this work. There's this uh, beautiful and awesome work by a Filipino architect, Sangai Architects. You can see how, how, uh, how awesome the, the design is, how we put a lot of thought in his design. Uh, the most famous of which is, is this design. I don't know if you're familiar with this. But the Sangai architect uh, design pitch is, listen to this, transforming your surroundings one bamboo at a time. So architects, gone are the days when we think of bamboo as a poor man's building materials. These architects are making bamboo sexy and we have to start doing that, okay? Finally, we can be inspired by the work of this young Thai architect up Bunsanan, who during the construction phase of the zero carbon resort cottage in Palawan, had to relocate to Palawan for months from Thailand huh, to immerse in bamboo design and construction. And you know what uh, he, he has now for himself? He now has this firm Thai bamboo architecture which, build, which builds with mostly bamboo as a material and he's doing really well in Thailand. He's now one of the authorities, authorities in bamboo architecture in Thailand. And he, start, he started out as an apprentice during the construction period of this zero carbon resort cottage. It makes sense if we consider this, this uh, quotation by Dirk Hebel, an architect, and let me read from it. We need to shift from a mining ideology to a kind of cultivating ideology. Cultivating in the sense that we are moving towards the idea of growing our own construction materials. It makes sense to be able to grow our own materials and it is very much possible in the Philippines. Again, I'm, introdu I'm introducing a niche, a possible niche for bamboo propagation. Yes, bamboo can be grown in the Philippines and we definitely has a lot of uh, uh, open areas to, to propagate bamboo for our own bamboo use. Sustainable projects do not have to be big to make a huge impact. The CCR cottage is not one big solution, but it is made up of many small solutions in the same direction. Is it a perfect solution? Of course not. Given a, chance, given a chance to do it again, will I change anything? Yes, I will. I will change a lot. 
there's always an opportunity to improve on things. What is the Green Action Plan then? I propose this to all of us architects or even engineers who are here or, or, or those who are, real, uh, who are wanting to be architects and engineers in the future. We have to look back and learn. Number two, we have to look to the future and prepare. And we have to look at the present and act to create more sustainable structures leading to the present. We have to look to the present and act. That is the green action, la action plan. Moreover, we need to get to the core of sustainability to make an impact. We shouldn't be satisfied with greenwashing all the time. We say we are green architects, but are we really practicing green architecture? Green architecture is not just about procuring green blinks and showcasing them in our projects. We need to, the, to get to the core of sustainability to make an impact, and we need to do it now. As design professionals, you have to ask, what can we do? And as lead design professionals, you have to lead towards the direction of sustainability towards green architecture. As design professionals, again, we need to stop thinking that green architecture is expensive, that green architecture is not marketable, that green architecture is just an option. Because in the light of this pandemic and climate change, there is no other way but green architecture. Because beyond green, pure green projects are projects that make the world measurably better. This responsibility is in our hands as lead design professionals and we have to do it now. Thank you everyone. And thank you for having me here in this event. All right. Well, thank you very much, uh, Architect Ed, for a very beautiful and uh, practical presentation. I like it when you said uh, that we have to look at the past to learn, future to prepare, and present to act. Well, at this point, we are very much ready to entertain some questions from uh, our participants. Let's start with our first question. It says, what impact can the extensive use of bamboo in all types of construction have in efforts toward have in effort toward achieving not only zero carbon buildings, but sustainable, restorative, and regenerative development as well. Question coming from UAP Singapore, architect Jay Mendoza. Again, the use of bamboo is not uh, a huge, uh, it's not a huge, uh, the zero carbon resort cottage is not a big solution, but it is a small solution towards the same direction. If all of us uh, can grow our own materials because bamboo is, is easy to grow, then we would have achieved a sustainable, restorative and regenerative development as well. If we can make use of a, of a material that we can grow ourselves and is available locally in our countries, then uh, we, we, we will be able to, to we will be able to participate in a regenerative development. Because uh, again, I mentioned that uh, our uh, natural res resources are getting depleted. Materials are getting scarce, but with bamboo and with other uh, renewable uh, resources, we have a chance to, to not only be end consumers of building materials, but we're actually growing our own materials. And that, that for me is, uh, uh, is uh, towards the goal of uh, getting into uh, zero carbon buildings. By zero carbon, I mean producing energy that you're actually using. Okay, I hope that answers the question. And just before we jump into the next question, uh, Architect Jay is also promoting and encouraging everyone to support their YouTube channel by subscribing in it. The link is posted in the chat box. Next question coming from UAP Singapore architect Mylon Usbal. New technologies are smart. They use composite materials to mimic the natural materials, showing the same authentic look and feel of the materials, strengthen the materials and create maintenance free. On the other hand, 
they consider also sustainable green architecture material, energy efficient, and zero carbon parameters. They also reuse waste materials as a base component. What are your thoughts about it? We can definitely recycle, we can upcycle, we can, we can create composites out of material. As long as at the end of the life cycle, they become, they, they are decomposed. Bamboo is, because it's natural, you, you can actually use it uh, as, as, as fertilizers. As it, it can decompose into, into a material that will not be, at the end of the day, uh, uh, contributing to, to, to our garbage pile. So we welcome materials that, again, can be recycled, can be upcycled, but we have to consider their life cycle also. What will happen to it at the end of its uh, material usability? All right, so next question. How do we move from demonstration cottages applying appropriate technology to become mainstream in society? Coming from UAP Makati Greenbelt Chapter Architect Mike Guerrero. You know what? We can do it one architect at a time. Again, the, I presented the, what I presented to you are small solutions. If each of us architects will, will, will make, start uh, using small solutions towards the same direction, we would have contributed to a, a better society where all of us are, are responsible in terms of uh, using appropriate technology. Uh, again, I have no, I have no, um, I'm not averse with, with high technology, but uh, I believe that uh, we have to use appropriate technology um, depending on, on, on our uh, actual use and our actual consumption of that technology. Uh, this, again, this demonstration cottage is, is to showcase the impact of a small project uh, towards um, probably uh, inspiring others to, to, to do the same things, uh, small steps uh, towards sustainability. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. And another question. There is a growing trend of using bamboo and other traditional and sustainable materials in modern designs for single family residences, especially in tropical countries, as the physical attributes of bamboo durability when uh, lacquered and or laminated, tensile and compressive strength, thermal efficiency, low cost sustainability, etc., gain greater acceptance as an ideal construction material. Do you see the use of bamboo and possibly other traditional materials extend to multi-level and large scale structure? I think this is kind of like related to the previous question. So that's coming yeah. from architect Jay Mendoza. Uh, yes, I can see that uh, bamboo being used extensively on as an uh, engineered product. Uh, being made use to, to span a longer spans. Uh, uh, what we have in the Mactan Airport, uh, 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 the wood frame Mactan Airport uh, construction is, 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 is actually a prelude to this. To this. I, I, I actually asked the, the supplier of that, that uh, long span uh, engineered wood, how come you, you uh, have you ever thought of using bamboo? as a raw material for your long span uh, timber construction. And they, and they said they are actually in the R&D process for this. So hoping uh, that this product will be available for us in the future because that is really something to work on as architects, long span bamboo, engineered bamboo. Okay. And uh, do we have other questions? There is a side note, uh, just like to read the side note from architect Ed, or from rather from uh, architect Cabalan, UAP Cabalan, very informative with what we can still innovate with bamboo as building materials in the context of fire code adherence. What are the considerations with the zero carbon cottage? I get, that's a question. <laughs> okay, bamboo being, being a combustible material is, is definitely prone to, to combustion and to so what we did is to, to uh, put a coating of fire retardant to it so that uh, at least it will, uh, will be fire safe in a way. 
which can actually be replicated to other bamboo constructions as well. Okay, so there is a something that we can uh, coat or can put to make it fireproof or something like that. Yeah? Just like any other timber product. Okay. Yeah. All right. Another question from UAP Qatar, Anita, architect Anita. Sir, which bamboo is best for construction and industrial use, especially in re with regard to strength and size? Thank you. For the Philippines, uh, for all the structural components, meaning the poles and the beams and gears of the zero carbon uh, cottage, we use of the uh, Kawayan Tinik because of its uh, the thickness of its combs and the, the, the diameter by which it grows in. Mm -hmm. the, problem, the problem that we encountered with bamboo is the dimensional stability. We, because uh, of course you know that the bamboo is, is, is wide from the base and it tapers as it grows up. So you really have to work on, on how you detail it properly to be, for it to be able to be used as uh, girders for long spans. Okay, so I hope that answers the question. Another question from UAP Baguio, Jovrile Pimentel, how do we remove biases that bamboo and other sustainable materials are not temporary, strong, and are just as long lasting as common building materials such as cement or etc.? Again, it, it will start with one architect at a time. If we start using bamboo, uh, because we, we have stopped thinking that bamboo is a poor man's material, we, uh, if we follow the footsteps of Shanghai architects, follow the footsteps of uh, uh, Tap Bunsanan, uh, making use of bamboo as a primary uh, building materials, then people will be educated and in this information will be disseminated to everyone. Okay. And another question of coming from a student, uh, UAPL Caldia. Uh, for students, they go to museums for insights and to spark interest with the sustainable practice. But for those already in practice of architecture that plans to shift to such sustainable designs, where do we go? Are there any practical seminars or workshops that may help? Oh, that is where Green AP comes in. Uh, we, we offer these this, uh, seminars uh, regularly. Uh, and uh, in the light of this pandemic, our seminars are now, will now be offered online, okay? And also uh, uh, building up on what Dr. Clayton uh, shared to us, there are edX courses on sustainability. And I think uh, PUP, uh, College of Architecture is also offering courses now on bamboo construction or bamboo architecture. I think they, I don't know, I, I may be wrong, but uh, they're the only ones who are offering this in their curriculum, which is a good thing. All right. So there are um, groups or institutions uh, who can provide knowledge and information about this, okay. Mm -hmm. And, okay, so there is a advertisement. Please like us on Facebook, Green Architecture Advocacy Philippines. So, oh, yeah. that is, okay, yeah. Yeah, you can learn more about the program and the advocacies by going or by finding them on Facebook. Again, it's Green Architecture Advocacy Philippines. Yeah, let's talk about it uh, online because we are willing to, to explore, to talk to you about your sustainability needs in terms of seminars and, and all this. Okay, that's good to know. Um, from our participants, any more questions you'd like to raise? Okay, if there is none, well, to our bamboo man, for a second, I thought we were talking about talking to bamboo manyalak. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, architect Ed, maraming maraming salamat po for your time today. And thank you for showing us what a true trailblazer, you know, can uh, do in pursuit of green architecture. And know that if not all, many of us here are one with you in our in your advocacy towards net zero carbon and in reconnecting people with nature through architecture and design. So, 
Yeah, and uh, at this point, we'd like to present to you our virtual certificate of appreciation. Please also accept this in behalf of the UAP United Architects of the Philippines, Union ng mga Arkitekto ng Pilipinas, Singapore Chapter. Certificate of appreciation is hereby presented to architect Edgardo Maliari, Deputy Chairperson Green Architecture Advocacy Philippines, Principal Architect ELM or ELM ARC, Certified Verde Profet. For imparting his valuable insights and inspiration as the webinar speaker during the 14th UAPSG seminar with the theme Green Architecture, the Impact on the Living Environment Towards Zero Carbon Buildings Green Action Plan. Given this 19th of September 2020, Singapore signed architect Mark Lester Alcantara Valignota, UAP, UAP Singapore Chapter, and co-signed by architect Luisito, Luisito Dumalaon, UAP District Director, UAP Regional B1. Architect Ed, please accept this Certificate of Appreciation. Thank you very much. It's an honor to uh, accept that Certificate of Appreciation. Again, thanks for having me here. It's a privilege to share my, my humble knowledge to everyone here. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, of course. We deem that it's very important nowadays, you know, that uh, we we make use of uh, what's available and what's practical and what's good for our nature. And, well, and since we've talked about bamboos a lot, as an architect, you guys can be like a bamboo, you know, bend but don't ever break. So I guess that's uh, how I can uh, put it into something uh, inspirational. And of course, um, at this point, well, thank you once again, Architect Ed. We'll see you soon. And uh, I'm sure some of our participants will get in touch with you and go to your uh, web uh, FB page and further uh, question, ask questions. Yeah, it's sure, nice. sure. Thank you very thank much. You. All right, see you later. And at this point, ladies and gentlemen, before we do the closing remarks, we'd like to remind everyone about our poll um, in our effort to make this webinar series uh, get better and better. We'd like you to answer um, questions or several uh, surveys. And if you think that uh, we do good, then select the, uh, the appropriate answer and uh, submit. Because again, your voice matters, your opinion matters. And to wrap these things up for tonight, I would like to call on. Uh, okay, sorry, I just got distracted. Thank you, Architect at USP. Galing din ni Jonathan yung maraming maraming sa. I just had to mention that. Thank you very much for that. And also, uh, yeah, to, to for the closing remarks, I would like to call on once again and give the limelight to our ever hardworking, hindi siguro napapagod nung uh, ating President UAP Singapore Chapter President. Please welcome Architect Mark Lester Valignata. Hi, good evening to all. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, thanks to all our guest speakers and uh, chapters and uh, guest attendees. Uh, in response to COVID-19 global crisis, the United Architects of the Philippines Singapore chapter, together with the United Architects of the Philippines Regional District B1, is finding ways to innovate, engage, and connect from a distance. This webinar will explore those innovations that are being deployed for the near term and for the future. A joint sustainable webinar series for the green architecture, the impact of the living environment. To our guest speaker, Dr. Clayton Miller and architect Edgardo Maliari, digitalization has already transformed our interactions and transactions, habits and habitats, particularly in relation to the implementation of new technologies and research and data science for the building industry. The importance of harnessing the spirit of innovation and new technologies towards zero carbon buildings, green action plan in the interest of our society's paramount in a world where connected to built environment. And to our webinar, and to our series of webinar and events, explore how industry leaders can positively change some of the world's most important challenges. Uh, to wrap it up, to wrap it up, thank you to our UAP Regional District V1. UAP Singapore chapter, especially to Manila Arkizonian, Manila Tiller chapter, Manila Centrum, Manila Metro chapter, Manila Mesa, uh, Samba chapter, and uh, to Dr. Narchila Conejos for helping us out with our uh, invaluable guest speakers and research doctors, architects who have been part of this uh, 
uh, keynote speakers to be able to share with our chosen fields of ex expertise to our district director, Luisito Dumalaon, for the support system and kind assistance to our district to thrive. And to UAP Singapore Chapter Committee Head, Green Architecture, Jay Mendoza, uh, and to all the board of directors and committee heads of UAP Singapore Chapter, thank you for the support. Um, I could say, and I think thanks enough. And uh, Jonathan, thank you also. Cheers and mabuhay. Stay connected. Stay united. Majula Singapura. Majula Singapore. I learned that uh, throughout the course of this webinar series. So, okay, guys, uh, it's been uh, another fruitful webinar series. So with this, we'd like to also invite you to the upcoming two more. We still have two more webinar series, two days uh, left for the whole month of September. Tomorrow is the next one uh, from 3 to 6 p.m. We will be joined. Is, can we flash uh, the poster on the screen, Architect uh, President Mark? Uh, we will be talking about rethinking sustainable design, creating an architecture of resilience for current times, very timely topic. So I hope you guys can join us tomorrow and also uh, a topic about placemaking. So we have three speakers for uh, tomorrow. So please join us again. That's uh, from 3 until 6 p.m. tomorrow. So kita kita tayo ulit. And on September 26 is the last webinar series for the month uh, with a topic of improving wellness through vertical greenery and a decade of practical green lessons learned. So there will be a lot of um, topics to be discussed and things to be learned. So please stay tuned and um, you know, uh, we're all in this together. And also, by the way, before I forget, tomorrow there will be a charity feeding program um, at Silver Lining in Smoky Mountain. So if you guys are free tomorrow, uh, just reach out to DD to our district director, architect Luis Domalaon. If you want to spare your free time, um, join us in this uh, very meaningful event. So as you can see, guys, uh, the, those are, are our speakers, um, some of the speakers that we've had in the past few days and some more who will be joining us uh, towards the end of the month. So, okay. So once again, we thank you very much. We hope to see more and more participants as we close the month of September. Maraming maraming salamat. And thank you, everyone. God bless. Stay safe. OK. Oh, by the way, let's flash the um, list of attendants and all the participants who have just joined us today. Here they are. I don't get to certificate. And don't go away, guys, because we'll have uh, like a group picture for souvenir and for documentation purposes. All right, there you have it. It's been nice to see all architects coming from different regions of in the country coming together for one cause, and that's uh, green architecture. All right, so let's have a group picture. Uh, please turn on your camera and give your sweetest smile. All right, press mark. Are we good? Yes. Uh, All right. We're done. All right, we're so done. So, guys, thank you. Happy weekend. We'll see you tomorrow.